kingdom of heaven is not something that happens after the second coming it's something that happens right here and now matthew um, chapter 10 verses 6 to 8 go to the lost confused people right here in the neighborhood tell them that the kingdom of he heaven is here bring health to the sick raise the dead touch the untouchables kick out the demons you've been treated generously so live generously matthew uh, yeah matthew 9 our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, which is probably the key verse for the CHIP program. God's kingdom was his theme that beginning right now, they were under God's government, a good government. He also healed people of their diseases and of the bad effects of their bad lives. And the CHIP program is about helping people to be healed from the bad effects of the bad lives one of the challenges we've got though as a as an Adventist church and it, it's not just the Adventist church it, it's all all human organizations but the God Jesus created the church to go out and be the kingdom of heaven right here and now not for the people that are already in the church but for the people outside of the church the problem is that most the Adventist church is a social organization and most social organizations have a hierarchical structure that looks a little bit like this. Okay? And the problem is, for the people at the top of the tree, it's nice. But for the people further down, it's not very nice. And the most important thing in a social club is your position. I'll, I'll take that off before people get too offended. But 
the most important thing in a social club is your position in that social club. And that came home to me on one occasion when I was a a pastor of a church a long, well, long, a long, long way from here in another country. And I actually used to play golf on a Wednesday morning. Um, and at the golf club, there was a bloke there. His name was Brian. He had been secretary of that golf club for the last 25 years. And Brian was now in his late 70s. And they were trying to replace Brian as secretary of the golf club. And Brian was fighting tooth and nail to maintain his position as secretary in the golf club. And at the church I was pastor of, we had a senior deaconess who had been senior deaconess for 37 years. She was a lovely lady, but she was starting to lose it. It was time to let, let a younger person come on. And she was fighting tooth and nail to maintain her position as the, as the senior deaconess. Because the reason she got out of bed in the morning was because she was the senior deacon. That was who she was. But that's not what the church is about. The church is about getting out and impacting people's lives. And I want to show you this video clip that talks about um, why we do chip. Okay, let's see if we can get some sound. Go on, go back, and we'll start that again. Okay, fire up. Good. Now, where's our sound? Okay, sorry about this, folks. This is my problem, it's not the um, audiovisual team's problem. And that should be. Come on. Sorry, it's actually Bluetooth, but I've got it wired, I've got it connected up via the wire at the moment. Sorry? Let's have a look. Okay, just escape from that. Um, this is my problem, not yours, mate. Sorry, but um, what's our um, playback devices? And um, try, try going on to settings. Okay, external speaker. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe because we're going HDMI. HDMI, that's why I'm... That's what so I'm. We can possibly have yeah, but that's we should be. Playback devices. There we are. Projector. That's what I've got. Set as default. Okay. Now here we go. And back to here. That's better. Okay, so I've got to stand here close enough so they're picking that up. What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment?
I have a, um, a hobby. I have a number of hobbies. But one of my things I like doing is I like going into cemeteries and looking at the tombstones. And it's interesting. Some cemeteries are going to get into your whole life and raise them a certain time because they're never going to find through. But sometimes we see some really interesting epitaphs. Here lies the, wife, the body of Elizabeth, wife of Major General Hamilton, who was married 47 years and never did one thing to upset her husband. She died 14th of April, 1749. That will not be my wife's epitaph. What about this one? Here lies the body of Anne, 1845 to 1893. Wife of Ben, buried alive. Now she has beef, and so does Ben. Safe, here lies the body of Ezekiel Arty, age 102. Only the good die young. Here lies the body of Dorothy Parker, 15th of February, 1906 to 23rd of December, 1998. Where else she went, including here? against the better judgment. A record to the memory of John McFarlane, drowned in the waters of the earth by a few affectionate friends. And this is my favourite one. Sacred to the memory of Major James Wood, who was killed by the accident and discharge of a pistol by his orderly, 14th of April, 1831. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And this is one that caught my attention. Here lies the body of Paul Meredith, who lived a merry life and died a merry death. And it just so happens that my middle name is Meredith. My name is Paul Meredith Rankin. Meredith apparently is a family name. I, for many years, I didn't appreciate my mother giving her oldest son the middle name of Mary, but that's another story. But sooner or later, there's going to be a tombstone that reads something like this. And on that tombstone are going to be two dates. 
And while we have no control over the first days on that tombstone, what about for instance nine and a half months before we were some of our business? But we do have a lot of control over that second day on that tombstone. And I, my youngest daughter said to me about five years ago, Dad, I've got it all figured out. On your 102nd birthday, we're going to go hang gliding in the morning. We're going to come back. We're going to have a great big birthday party for lunch. We're going to go to bed that night and not wake up in the morning. And I said, Rachel, that would be fantastic. That would suit me just fine. But that wasn't going to be the case. That's my wedding photo. That was taken 31 years ago. Um, and yes, that was my hero. It was not a wig. At that stage, I weighed about 95 kilos. Um, that's a photo of me on the on your left hand side there, taken about 12 years ago. I weighed 115 kilos at that stage. I went and saw the doctor. My cholesterol level was 8.5, because you know cholesterol levels are very, very high. My blood pressure was 160 and 120. My fasting blood glucose was about 6.5, 6.7, just borderline type 2, 7 is considered to be type 2 diabetes. And the doctor said to me, Paul, we're going to have to start putting you on some medication. I wasn't keen on going on medication. At that stage, I was in the late 40s. And so I actually discovered or heard about the CHIP program. I just couldn't do a CHIP program, but I adopted the principle of the CHIP program. And I lost now about 40 kilos. I, my weight now is about 70, 72, 73 kilos. Sometimes I get to 74 kilos, but sits around that, around that level. The difference it's made to me has just been phenomenal. That's a photo of me doing a presentation um, a couple of years ago. I've been able to do things I never would have dreamt of doing. A couple of years after I made those lifestyle changes, a group of us rode our bikes from the bottom of New Zealand to the top of New Zealand. Now it's cross New Zealand, it only takes 15 minutes to ride a bike across New Zealand. We rode from the bottom to the top. We rode from Invercargill, where Pete there is, is from Invercargill. We rode from Glass. Most people think that's the end of the earth, and Glass is a big sign up where the highway begins. And we wrote from Glass to um, Cape Randall, right up the, um, the top of New Zealand. That's actually Glass, um, and that's Cape Randall at the top of New Zealand. 2,347 kilometres, the average 100 kilometres a day. I couldn't have dreamt of doing that. I'd always wanted to fly hand gliders. It's a bit hard to get a hand glider with a parabit in the way 115 kilos. That's a photo of me hand gliding um, just at Catherine Hill Bay, a beach about 20 minutes drive from where I live up on the um, central coast in um, South Wales. But to me personally, it's given me a lot more ability to just walk on. It doesn't take my relationship with God. It's not about what I eat or what I, what I um, exercise like that. It's about a relationship. But it's given me the ability to serve God in ways that I've never dreamt. One of the things I grew up in Papua New Guinea, and this, my parents moved out there when I was a kid, and I went back out there and I worked out there. Two aeroplanes out there in the early 90s. Um, but in New Guinea, the big thing is number. And if someone's really important, they have number. And that was illustrated to me on one occasion when I was a young person out there in this um, settlement. Flying back up to New Guinea, landed at Port Moresby Airport, and at that stage, it was just a tin shed on the side of a, a grass runway. And we landed there, and it wasn't grass, it was a sealed runway, but it was an old army air, um, runway, but it was all um, sea airstrip. And the 707 landed. And the tractor would drive out with a trailer behind it, and they'd take the bags out of the cargo hold of the 707, put them on the trailer, the trailer would come back, and there would be a table there. And the, uh, one of the locals would take the bags off the trailer, put them on the table, and you'd take your bag. And the porter, all he had on was a big string around his middle with a few leaves tucked in the front of the, the string. He put the bag off the trailer, put it on the table, and I said, thank you. And he looked at me, and he was talking pigeon English, but he said, you think I'm a nobody? I've got number. And I said, tell me, how do you have number? And it turned out his name was Joseph, or his anglicized name was Joseph. And Joseph had been loading up the, the cargo on a 707 aeroplane. And the plane took off, and they couldn't find Joseph. And they looked everywhere for Joseph. And eventually they came to the conclusion, he must be trapped in the hold of the 707 aeroplane. And so they radioed the pilot, and the pilot, it was a direct flight from Moresby to Sydney. The pilot made an emergency descent to 10,000 feet and then landed at Brickley Council Airport. And they opened up the hold of the aeroplane and they found Joseph unconscious there. And they brought him out and they laid him out on a hot tarmac. 
And he told me that he, he woke up and he opened his eyes and looked up and there was all these white men in coats standing there looking at him. And he thought he had died and gone to heaven. And so he put him back on the aeroplane, ran some clothes, put some clothes on him, put him back on the aeroplane, flew, flew into Sydney. And of course, the media heard about this. And so there was television channels doing interviews with him. There was pictures in, he had pictures in his newspaper, in newspapers all around the world. And he said, see, I've got number. I made a 707 here at Aeroplane Land at Council, and I've got my photo in newspapers all around the world. I've got number. And my question is, what is it if you just number as a 707? And I'd like to suggest to you that the health message is part of that. Rodney Star is a sociologist, and he looks at what's called people movement. And people movement is when a whole lot of people get together and start doing something in unison. Right now, there's a people movement happening over in India it's called ISIS. Okay? And people are going, you know, people from Australia, from all over Europe, are going to join the, the people um, in the Middle East. But Rodney Star discovered that one of the largest people movements in history was started by 11 dis- disenfranchised men in about 30 AD. And they led what within 300 years had become the largest or the dominant political, or the dominant political and religious force in the then known world. And that was Christianity. The book Subtitle. How the obscure marginal Jewish movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world in a few centuries. And Rodney Stark wasn't a Christian when he wrote this book. He became a Christian as part of his research. That's incidental. But he said there was four things. First of all, the Christian church grew by gradual individual conversions by social networks with family, friends, and colleagues. With the exception of the day of Pentecost, the Christian church didn't grow by mass evangelistic campaign. If you look at the record in the book of Acts, where Peter went from town to town, what did he do when he went into a new town? Put up big banners saying, dead men do tell tales, and you know, blow up a big goal of Daniel 2, the end of the Daniel 2, and start the pain? No. What did he do when he went into a different town? He met with a group of people down by a river. Okay? He went to the synagogue. He went up onto a hill, Mars Hill, and he just talked to the people there. And it was that gradual individual conversion. He also goes on to point out that the Christian church treated women with dignity and respect. In the pagan world, women were chattel that were bought and sold. Thinking back in your ancient history, the history of Edward High School, can you think of a prominent woman? in the ancient world who's not mentioned in the Bible. Most people say think hard enough. I said, oh, what about Cleopatra? Well, why was Cleopatra famous? Because she had an affair with Julius Caesar and the number one was named Mark Anthony. And when the affair with Mark Anthony fell apart, do you remember what she did? She's forgotten history. She committed suicide. Yeah, she put a snake through an axe, wasn't it, down the front of her dress and it bit her and she died of suicide. Women have two purposes in life. To look after a man and to produce children. And that, that the Christian church treated the women with dignity and respect. And if you look at the New Testament, there's a whole pile of women who are mentioned in the New Testament. Can you name some of the women from the New Testament? Huh? Phoebe, yeah. Priscilla, okay. And Priscilla's a really interesting one because it's Priscilla and Aquila, which is most unusual. Normally it would have been Aquila and his wife, but she's not mentioned at all. But in the New Testament, it's Priscilla and Aquila. Okay? And there's some theologians who think it was actually Priscilla who helped Paul write the book of Hebrews. We don't know for sure. Okay? And then, of course, you've got Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary, and there's Shalom, and there's Dorcas, and there's Juno, who Paul refers to as a fellow apostle. apostle. It's interesting because the women of the Christian church. The other thing was, because of its value of women, the Christian church banned abortion and infanticide. Abortion was a commonly practiced method of birth control in the ancient world. For 25%, according to Rodney Stark's research, 25% of the women who had abortions died as a result of those abortions. And infanticide, the practice of killing babies at birth, this female babies because they weren't valued, were common, commonly killed at birth. As a result of the banning of those two practices, there was a very high ratio of women in the Christian church, a lot higher in the pagan world. And a lot of pagan men married Christian women and became Christian as a result of that. And I think we see that reflected in Corinthians where Paul gives advice to women whose husbands aren't Christian. 
And he said the most important reason was that the Christians care for the sick. About eight, nine years ago now, I had the chance to go to Pompeii. Have any of you been to Pompeii? It's just sounds amazing. I say amazing if you get the chance. It's, it's phenomenal. And they also sell the best gelato of any place in the world. Just outside Pompeii. That's another story. But <laughs> if you go to Pompeii, it was destroyed by the Mount Vesuvius in 70 AD. But I went to Pompeii and I discovered where the pedestrian crossing comes from. Is that where crossing comes from? Because in Pompeii, the streets are all about half a meter lower than the sidewalk. And there's stepping stones, long stones with gaps between them, obviously for the, whole, for the cartwheels to go between, to get from one side of the street to the other side. And I asked the question, why is the street half a meter lower than the sidewalk? And what do you think the answer was? The street was the sewer. Okay? And the first thing the slave would have done when he went into the master's house in the morning was get the night bucket and get chucked out into the street. There was no running water sewer like we have today. It was an open sewer. There would have been dead animals in the sewer. All the rubbish was put out in the sewer. A city like Rome could not survive with its own population because of the disease in Rome. It was only the fact that they were bringing in conquest, conquest, bringing in people from up, up, up from the conquest that kept Rome alive. Every 15 years, there was an epidemic of the Black Death, the, 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 the bubonic plague that went through Rome. And every time there was a hint of the bubonic plague, all of the physicians and all of the priests and normal people were sick to the countryside. And it was the Christians that stayed back and cared for the sick. And Stark says that the most significant reason for the growth of the early Christian church was they cared for the sick. The Council of Nicaea, 324, 325 AD, which came up with the Nicene Creed, one of the two fundamental creeds of the Christian church. Um, but most of us look at the Nicene Creed and the big de- creed and the big debate about the Trinity that happened at, in, as part of the, the Council of Nicaea. But the Nicene Creed also passed resolution that every cathedral in Europe had to have a hospital associated with it. And that the hospital movement came out of the Christian church. Stark concludes by saying, no wonder the early missionaries were so warmly received. For what they brought was not simply a new urban movement, but a new culture capable of making life in Greco Roman cities more tolerable. When I left school, I did my nursing training. And in those days, each ward had a woman that was dressed like that. And what do you call the first woman in charge of the ward? You know, no, matron was in charge of the whole hospital. Okay, matron we didn't even talk to as we should. The sister, the sister was in charge of the ward. And ward two, the Sydney Adventist Hospital, had sister week. And all of us male nurses lived in Syria and Trim. Some of you are laughing, you know, no sister week. And we lived in Syria and Trim in the sister week. I actually got to know her when I finished nursing. She's actually a really nice person. But she ran a, a very military style ward. And if we took one foot out of line, she would come down almost like a tongue grip. She made us better nurses because of that. But that term sister comes from their mums. Who committed their lives to caring for the sick? That's where the term comes from. And it's probably best exemplified. Who's that on the screen? Mother Teresa. Okay? Mother Teresa, who committed her life to caring for the sick and dying on the streets of Calcutta. And she says that she looks into the eyes of someone dying on the streets of Calcutta. And when she, and she saw them, what she saw when they looked back at her is she saw Jesus looking back at her. And that is probably the epitome of the Christian message. The Seventh Day Adventist Church started in the 1830s. In 1863, it was organized um, as a church. But interestingly enough, in 1863, one of the founders of the Adventist Church, a woman by the name of Ellen White, who I believe had the gift of prophecy, was given a received a vision talking about house worship. And there were eight principles of health that she got on the 6th of June, 1863. And it's summarizing that from a new start, which is, you know, new start, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust, was what um, she talked about there. And she advocated not smoking back in the days when physicians were prescribing cigarette smoking to the asthma. Okay? She advocated a plant based diet, moving away from the meat based diet. And interestingly, she struggled with that change from a meat based diet herself. One of, her le- one of the letters that she's got, 
He talks about coming downstairs in the morning, they decided to move away from the bacon and eggs and porridge for breakfast. And she talks about coming downstairs in the morning and seeing this dinner on the table. And she couldn't bring herself to eat it. And for three days, she never had breakfast. So even she had struggles with it. But she comments about health. Try to her along with this piece of success and reach the people. The Savior mingled with man as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy to them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them follow him. Notice what he did. We have to run an evangelistic campaign. Yeah, please don't get me wrong. I think evangelism has its place. But what he did was he went out and he got to know people, worked out what they needed, met their needs, then he bade them follow him. When I was a nurse working in an accident emergency at Minimal Hospital, if someone came in with a broken arm, did they want me to tell them about Jesus? No, they wanted me to fix their broken arm. Okay? And so, first of all, we need to find out what people need, minister to those needs, and then get the opportunity to reach them if you tell them about Jesus. The medical missionary work is as the right arm of the third angel's message, which must be proclaimed to the fallen world. And as evidence, most of us know that statement, because we get the next part. Thus the sound of truth will go forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. How will the sound of truth go forth? By the medical missionary work. But one of the things that we do is we tend to professionalize what God asks us to do. Can you name an evangelist for me? Sorry? Moody. Why Moody? Okay, can you name another evangelist? Mark Finley. Okay? And can you name another evangelist? John Selworth. Yeah. Yes, Goldie's going to be very upset. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> okay, yes, no. Okay, but is that the biblical model of evangelism? If you look at Paul's first Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, he says we are all evangelists. Okay? It's really interesting. If you look at the Leviticus chapter, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 19, God actually says in Exodus chapter 19 that he wanted all Israelites to be the priests. The whole of the Israelite nation was to be a nation of priests. But then when Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, the Israelites made the golden calf and worshipped the golden calf. And there was only one sector of the Israelite nation, only one tribe that didn't worship the golden calf. They were the Levites. And so God took the priesthood off the whole of Israel and gave it to the Levites. But if we come back to the New Testament, Jesus restores the priesthood to all believers. Peter, First Peter, Revelation, we are a kingdom of priests. We are all priests, all evangelists. And we've done the same thing with health ministry. 1863 was when the, the church first got that vision of health. In 1866, they started the Western Health Reform Institute. The Western Health Reform Institute became Battle Creek Sanitarium. It became the largest hospital in the world. Three U.S. presidents were patients at Battle Creek Sanitarium while they were treating U.S. presidents. Um, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison were patients at Battle Creek Sanitarium. Under the leadership of John Harvey Kellogg, it became, as I said, the largest hospital in North America. It got burnt down. Other things happened. Kellogg's brother, John Harvey Kellogg, and his brother started Kellogg's Health Food Company, which is interesting now. The main competition is the sanitarium here in Australia. Okay? They revolutionized the way that people ate breakfast, cornflakes, all of these things came, came out of there. This year happened to be an Adventist hospital in Orlando, Florida. It's called Celebration Hospital. Celebration Hospital was built. This is a Walt Disney wanted to build a modern town in America. He called that town Celebration, and they wanted a hospital there. And so, as part of that hospital, as part of that hospital, or as part of it, they wanted to build a hospital in this town of um, Celebration. And so, the Disney Corporation asked for expressions of interest to build a hospital. One of the companies that put an expression of interest was the Seventh Day Adventist Church, because guess what? The hospital system they had at the time. It came down to a competition between two organizations, the Adventist Church and another organization. Michael Eisner, the chairman of the Disney board, gave a copy of both the expressions of interest to a professor from Stanford University. And the professor came back and said, look, both companies will build you a fantastic hospital. But I must say, when it comes to health, the Adventists wrote the book. And as a result of that, the Adventist Church got the contract to build this hospital. This is now the most profitable hospital in America. 
And because it's not for profit, all of their profit has to go back to the mission. Do you have any idea what the mission budget was in 2013? Any guess? Pardon? Not quite. One, one billion dollars. Their mission budget was one billion dollars in 2013. And about 50% of that was actually spent on providing children with the kidney cancer surgery and a number of other things they developed out of that. We do hospitals really well. In 2000, um, in about 2000, um, 2010, this conference was in the World Health Organization in Geneva. They had a split which was binding to the executive board there of the World Health Organization in Geneva. And in the executive board in the World Health Organization, the important people to start the club. They had um, Kevin Price, that's Christy Kuma, who I work with, Darren Ward, who does the videos, that's um, Jan Paulson, who was the president of the general conference at that time. And that's Sonia and myself sitting as far back as we could possibly get from the center of faith. But we were there, we were in the executive board there. And the question was asked why has the World Health Organization invited the Seventh day Adventist Church to the executive board there? And we were told that we were the first faith community ever to gather in the executive board in the World Health Organization. And we said, why? And the story was told, the World Health Organization is developed into religion. We're part of the Western Pacific Health Organization here. Um, but the Americas are the Pan-American Health Organization. And there was a new director for the Pan-American Health Organization. And she went um, to South America. And she went down, she drove down a dirt road, miles from nowhere. And at the end of that dirt road, she discovered a tent. And she asked who ran the tent. It was the Seventh Adventist Church. And she drove down another new dirt road. And somewhere else, she discovered another tent again, and discovered it was the Adventist Church. And she discovered this network of clinics right through South America, run by this organization she'd never heard of. And as a result of that, a memorandum of was understanding was signed in 2011 between the Adventist Church and the World Health Organization to promote um, health at a basic grassroots level in South America. In Australia, we've done that. We've got the clinic. Any of you been involved with the Dr. Clinic? Okay, we're about 15. In, in carbon, in the gym, exactly. And we've got clinics right there. Okay, and I see airplanes in carbon in the gym in the 90s. And there was one instance with the mobile, right up on the Indonesian border. You actually had to fly across the Indonesian border to land at the mobile. And there's a clinic there. We do clinics very, very well. The other thing is that because of the health Constructs within the Adventist Church. Seventh day Adventists are a unique people group. And since the 1960s, there's been this article, since 250 man uh, manuscripts, it's about 10 years ago, there's now over 350 manuscripts looking at the health status of over 100,000 Seventh day Adventists. And they find that Seventh day Adventists in Holland, on average, live 8. Point, or the males, 8.9 years longer than their general population. Norway, 4.2, Poland, 9.4. California, America, nine, sorry, Poland 9.5, California, America 9.4. And in Australia, it's 9.3 years longer than the average population. And that's not skinny Seventh day Adventists. That's not vegan Seventh day Adventists. That's Seventh day Adventists as a general population. And Gary Fraser, who's the lead researcher in that um, research project now, he's a New Zealander actually, um, he's got a house on the Palm Island. But Gary, Says, we have now established from men and women separately that modifiable health habits such as diet, exercise, fast smoking, and obesity together account for 12 years difference in longevity on average. 12 years of difference. Okay? And it's interesting. That's not just 12 years of survival at the end of your life. The average Australian spends six years in deteriorating health as they get towards the end of their life. For a person who has a life, healthy lifestyle, that period of deterioration, dramatic deterioration, is concatenated down to six, six months. So instead of six years, it's six months. And I don't know about you. I'm not overly concerned about dying. But the thought, the thought of spending six years having to take, having some teenager having to take into the toilet, and I mean, they don't get into the toilet and try and clean up the bed after me, is not my idea of entertainment. Okay? And a healthy lifestyle has been shown to improve that. In 2005, the National Geographic pu um, public started looking at the longest lived people group in the world. And in 2016, they published an update of that. The whole National Geographic magazine looking at the same thing. And they discovered 
that there were three people groups. They now they go back to five. But there were three people groups who had the highest rate of the old centurion, people living in past the age of 100. And that was Okinawa in Japan, Sardinia in Italy, and Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California. And when they looked at the common factors, they said they didn't smoke, they put people first, they were active every day, and their diet consisted mainly of vegetables, fruit, and grain. That's longevity, but what about things like cancer? In 2007, the World Cancer Research Fund um, published its findings um, through nutrition, through the activity and the prevention of cancer. A rough date was 2011, and there's a new report due to come out any time now. They found that the average, that for, in order to prevent cancer, you need to maintain healthy body weight, be physically active every day, limit consumption of energy dense food, eat foods mostly of plant origin, limit intake of red meat, and avoid processed meat. Limit, or they're now saying avoid, alcoholic drinks. Limit consumption of salt. Avoid moldy grains and poultry because of the upper toxins that grow on moldy grains. Aim to need nutritional supplements through diet alone. Mothers breastfeed their children, and for cancer survivors, follow the policies of life. Okay? That's information that we've known since 1862, and now we're seeing it coming out. But one of the, what we've seen in the last 30 years is a dramatic change in obesity rates. What I want to show you is the graphs from North America. And these I've downloaded from the Center for the Disease Prevention Control, CDC. I think the American government has two government health organizations. One is the National Institute of Health, and the other is the Center for Disease Control. And this is obesity in North America in 1985, 86. And you can see the second 30 years. 1991, they had to add on a few categories. Okay, 97, they had another category. 20% of the population, obese. Now, that's not 20% of the population overweight. That's obese. It's in my 30 or greater. Um, and we keep going. 2000, 2001, another category of added. 2005, 30% of, the popu- of that population most obese. 2010, okay? Um, and you can see over a 25-year period there, a dramatic explosion in obesity rates. And Australia has followed exactly the same trend. So what do you think it was that caused that explosion in obesity rates in a 25-year period? Sorry? Food? Okay. And two of the two factors there, food, and what do you think the other factor was? Huh? Inactivity. Yeah. Think back. I think back to 1962 when I started school. Okay, school was about two and a half kilometers away. How did I get to school? Well, it's just what you did. Okay, and I lived down the end of a, a dead end street, and I started, and about 50 meters down was a, a girl who, who lived there, and she would join me, and then by the time we got to school, there was about a dozen of us. Okay, I now live about 300 meters from the local school, and my next door neighbor drives me to the school. Yeah, that's the, the average Australian now walks. 16 kilometers a day less than they did in the 1960s. 16 kilometers a day less than they did in the 1950s. The other thing that's happened is we've seen a dramatic change in the food we use. After the Second World War, the American government began sponsoring farmers to grow certain types of crops. One of the crops they sponsored farmers to grow was corn, maize. Okay? And in the 1970s, America found itself with an enormous drought of corn. And that didn't get pesticides. Good, 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 good. And that corn, they didn't know what to do with. And instead of using it to feed the hungry in the world, the scientists worked on it and they worked out how to reduce, they worked out how to reduce sugar from that corn. It's called high fructose corn syrup. And if you go into a supermarket now, you go into your local coal, 85% of the packaged products on the shelf have got high fructose corn syrup in them in one form or another. Okay? And in Australia, we use sugar cane as well. But 85% of those products have got added sugar in them. That's caused a massive problem in our society. It's caused a massive explosion of type 2 diabetes. In the South Pacific, okay, South Pacific region, there's 2.5 million 
diabetes, how it was diagnosed in life by this. And probably that many Australians who are undiagnosed have some diabetes. And people are losing their limbs and losing their lives as a result of type 2 diabetes. Let me just tell you one of the reasons for that. Do you recognize the spot with finger? Everyone knows the finger when they may see it? Okay. Do you have any idea how much sugar is in that bottle of finger? Sorry? Let me show you. Okay. You can see on the back there, there's 72 grams of sugar in that bottle of finger. Now let me show you what 70 grams, 74 grams of sugar looks like. Okay. And hopefully in glasses you can see see the illustration. 74 grams of sugar. Okay. There is four grams of sugar in that teaspoon. So how many fours are there in 74? Sorry? How many fours in 74? 18, that's right. Okay, 18 and a half. Okay? So, let's have a look and see what 18 and a half teaspoons of sugar looks like. So, one, two, three, four, Amount of sugar in one bottle of Fanta. Now, when I was a kid, as I said, my parents and missionaries were passing me this. Okay, and we used to eat sugar cane. Has anyone eaten sugar cane? Okay. How much sugar cane can you eat in one sitting? Okay. Maybe half a meter of sugar cane? 300 mils, half a meter? If you're really going at it? Okay. Is there any way that you can eat a meter of sugar cane in one sitting? No. Do you know how much sugar cane it takes to produce one teaspoon of sugar? It takes two meters of sugar cane to produce one teaspoon of sugar. We've got 37 meters of sugar cane in that one glass of sugar. Now, there's no way humanly possible that someone could eat that much sugar cane. But we've taken a relatively healthy food like sugar cane. You know, just eating sugar cane, no problem whatsoever. Health strengthening teeth, cleans your teeth. Okay, there's a whole pile of micronutrients that come with that. We've taken something like sugar cane and we've turned it into empty calories. It's just as sweetness. Maybe it adds a bit of flavor to the food. But it gives us nothing else apart from that. And we've called it the cooler food. Let me give you another example. Oh, well, if you have Fanta in one hand, you don't have a chocolate bar in the other hand, don't you? Okay? That chocolate bar has got another nine and a half teaspoons of sugar in it. And I can't put nine and a half teaspoons of sugar in here, so I can't say how much that is. But that's what a lot of teenagers consider to be morning tea. Okay? And they're having the equivalent of 46 meters. Sorry, that's not 46. Um, for an 18, for 18 plus 37 is what? Um, 55 meters of sugar cane. Okay? In one sitting. Let me give you another example. A 100 gram potato is 70 calories. Now, the average person, the average male needs about 2,400 calories a day to maintain body weight. The average female, 2,200. It varies a little bit depending on that. But, eat more than that, you put on weight, eat less than that, you lose weight. A 100 gram potato, a boiled potato or a roast potato, is 70 calories. If you turn that 100 grams of potato into McDonald's French fries, you've got 350 calories. If you turn that 100 grams the Pringles chips, and you've got 500 calories. Okay? Now, I don't know about you. I can eat 100 grams of Pringles chips just like that and come back for more. I can't eat eight medium sized potatoes because, you know, boiled potatoes, my stomach's not big enough to hold that. And that's what we're looking at with the food. We've taken food the way it's grown, the way it's meant to be eaten, and we've turned it out to something else that's before food that is not really food. And we'll look at that in a bit more. Look at the death rates. In Australia, 
in 2014. Okay, the 2015 ones have just been released, but that's the 2014. There was a total of 153,580 deaths in Australia in 2014. Of those, 45,000, or 29.3%, were caused by diseases of the surface tissue. That's a stroke or a heart attack. Okay? A further 21.9%, 44,734, were caused by neoplasm. Neoplasm is generic term for cancer. Okay? So we have here 58% of our deaths are caused by either surface tissue disease or neoplasm. Another 7.8% are caused by dementia um, or Alzheimer's disease. And some scientists are now calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes because there's a very clear link between Alzheimer's disease and lifestyle. And then diabetes and life is caused another 2.8%. That means we've got, how are they going? Are they still online? Well, good, excellent. That means we've got close to 60% of our deaths here. And of those 60% of those deaths, at least 70% of them, probably close to 90% of them, are directly related to lifestyle. Okay? Interestingly, less than 1% of deaths were caused by traffic accidents. Now, that's the, what they, they've done a phenomenal job. They used to be close to 4,000 deaths a year, like 23,000 to 4,000 deaths a year were caused by traffic accidents. We've reduced that to um, 1,300, which is great. I'm not against that. But if you look at the billboard and TV advertising, what would you think is a major cause of death in Australia? Traffic accidents. We spend less than 2% of our health budget trying to prevent lifestyle diseases. And that's the environment we live in. Okay. And that's what Chip is about, trying to address that. What happens when religion and science come together? You get sick. The Complete Health Improvement Program is a scientifically proven lifestyle intervention that can prevent, arrest, and even reverse many health conditions. And I'd like to share with you now um, speaking of time, a couple of stories from people who have done the CHIP program. And this is Martin Kim. about getting his life back again, didn't he? And that was what he was excited about. That was what he was excited about. He was going to get back on the bike. The numbers coming along is great, but they're just numbers. It's the difference it makes in your actual lifestyle. Um, as I, I talked about my own experience um, of having lost weight and the difference that made for me. This is Dr. Han Gill, who's the founder of the CHIP program. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This year is Dr. Trevor Herlo um, and his wife, Lenora. Trevor and Lenora were left working in a town called Harwara. Does anyone here know where Harwara is? Harwara is in um, Taranaki, on the, what do we call it, the west coast of New Zealand. If you look at the map of the North Island of New Zealand, there's a big lump on the, on the west coast. Um, and that's called by Mount Egmont, or Mount Taranaki. 
on the coast of New Plymouth, and you can leave New Plymouth, go straight over the top of Mount Egmont down the other side, you come to little town of Harlow. Population of 8,000 people. Trevor was a local doctor in Harlow, and he got sick and tired of the patients coming back to him with lifestyle disease. He got hold of the CHIP program and he ran a CHIP program. I had heard of the CHIP program, but not seen any traffic. And I was working um, in the health department of the Adventist Church at that stage, and we gave them some funding for that program. And so Trevor asked me to come down for the graduation. I went down to the graduation, and I was sitting at the graduation, and we're sitting at a table with a woman called Jean. Jean was 72 at the time, and Jean got up to have her meal, and I said to Jean's daughter, What do you think of the CHIP program? She said, Paul, it's amazing. She said, six weeks ago, Mum could not talk on the telephone. She was so out of breath. She can now walk and talk on the telephone at the same time. And I said to Jean's son-in-law, what do you think of the CHIP program? He said, I don't like it. I said, what do you mean? He said, they're doing it out of a job. I said, where do you work? He said, I work at the abattoir, the meat processing company. But that was Jean's story. And she was so enthusiastic. And I, she was 72 at the stage. I ran into Jean about two years ago. She was almost 80 at that stage, and she literally came running up to me and said, Paul, Paul, I can still walk and talk on the telephone. And the difference that we saw it made there. And we have now had over 500 people go through a CHIP program in Harlow. And Trevor actually made the observation. The evidence, he said, before we started running CHIP in Harlow, if we shut the door of the evidence church in Harlow and walked away, no one in the community would have noticed. He said, there's now no one in Harlow that doesn't know someone that's done a CHIP program through the Adventist Church in Harlow. This here is a friend of mine called Jim, Winnie Murray. Winnie Murray is in her 70s. Winnie Murray is a Maori lady from the very north of New Zealand, a place called Pachau. And if you go right to Cape Rangan, which is the very top, you come back about 30 k's, and there's a little town called Pachau. Um, interestingly, for those of you that have grown up in the Adventist Church, you may have read stories by, by a bloke called Eric B. Hill from Burma. Eric B. Hill actually came from Pitao. That's another story. Pitao now, a little town of about 40 people, where they have major problems with lifestyle disease. Winnie didn't, had no education. She hadn't finished high school. She's a mother um, and a grandmother now. But she wanted to do something in her community. So she took the chip facilitator training on. She spoke to Jean. She went back to Pitao and she ran a chip program. She rang me up on Monday morning. And she said, Paul, Paul, we had our first program last night. There's only four people in my program. And I said, Winnie, how many people live in Pitao? And she said, oh, about 40. And I said, well, Winnie, you've got 10% of the population. That's phenomenal. She ran the program. Three months later, there was an advertisement in the local newspaper in Auckland, in South Auckland, asking for people to apply for funding to run programs targeting obesity in the Maori population in South Auckland. We applied some for, for funding, and as part of the funding process, we had to go to an interview panel. The chairman of the panel was a bloke by the name of Chad. And I was explaining CHIP, and Chad stopped me and he said, Paul, I know all about the CHIP program. And I said, Chad, how do you know about the CHIP program? And he said, Paul, my dad did CHIP. And I said, Chad, where did your dad do CHIP? And he said, dad did CHIP in Pitao. And as a result of that, we got quite a large amount of funding. We're able to run five CHIP programs for Maui and South Auckland. And I went along to the graduation of the last CHIP program, and a woman named Tanya came up to me and said, Paul, this is the most amazing lifestyle program I've ever seen. We've got to run this program on every Maui Marae, Maui village in New Zealand. And it just so happened that her husband has just been elected as an MP in the New Zealand, the last New Zealand election. Her husband, I won't tell you who he was, but he got elected into the New Zealand Parliament. Because a little old lady had a passion to do something in her community. We don't know what the ramifications of that are, that, of that are going to be. Chip can have its challenges, and one of them is going back to the Cook Islands. We wanted to do something with Chip in the Cook Islands, but we decided we needed to start with our ministers in the Cook Islands. And I don't know whether you can see this bloke here, Ali, that leg there, is an Article 3 leg because he's. Um, Best leg's been amputated due to complications of type 2 diabetes. This bloke here has got type 2 diabetes. This bloke up here has got type 2 diabetes. This bloke here has got type 2 diabetes. And I was working with a doctor over there, and he said to me, Paul, if we're going to do something, we've got to take them somewhere where there's no shops, otherwise they'll just go and buy food. 
And he says, my sister-in-law owns this island called Akiyami. It's called Akiyami um, Paradise. And it's just a, it's just a um, few hundred meters from island called One Foot Island. And it's actually where yeah, they did a survival program, a UK survival program over there, and that's where they actually got carried off the island and came back to Akiyami. And you wouldn't like it. It's white sandy beaches and palm trees and blue lagoon and beautiful top yet. It's not places like where they do. But we took all the ministers to Akiyami because it's two hours boat ride from the nearest shop. We figured it would take them about eight hours to swim to the shop if they got real hungry. And we put them on a quick diet for seven days. For the first three days, they complained bitterly because they thought we were trying to starve them. They were used to eating a high meat diet, corn beef. We put them on a whole fish, plant based diet, much they wanted to eat. But then on the fourth day, Elliot came and said, Paul, oh, I'm not sure what's happening, but I feel really good. And by the end of the week, these fellows had more energy than they had for decades. I was starting to see their diabetes settle down, their blood sugar levels settle down. And they went back to Varathana. That's what I That's my wife there. Yeah. She loves it. They went back to Varathana. They we now have the Deputy Prime Minister do a food program. We've had the Minister of Police go through a food program. We've had the Chinese representative. And we're seeing it making a difference in, um, in, in Varathana. I'd like to read you a letter I got from. Um, let me see where I can find it. An email I received um, from Naromo. And Naromo is from Kaolona, um, which is. Um, hang on. Naromo is from Kaolona, which is on the um, east coast of New Zealand, about two hours drive from Auckland. And he says, I have just experienced the most amazing transformation process in my life. At 25,000 plus Maori in Kalana Moana, I was the only one to register and graduate with Kalana. With increased devotion and commitment to managing my health in a new way. It's not easy as a Maori, I assure you, going into a place full of non Maori, with all my bias and prejudice. I soon distinguished that atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, obesity has no respect for culture, religion, or food. I found the most caring and supportive chick family, I am blessed. The chick family were outstanding, led by Dr. Rose, oh sorry, Dr. Barney, Rose, and Alan. In my life experience of religion, I waited to be pounced on in a hard to be gospel to come out. It never came. I thought maybe at graduation I would be ambushed. It never came. I found genuine people who cared, open, and embracing, and allowed me the privilege of exercising my freedom of choice. I came to church and met a church family. Of like mind, like heart, like spirit. Get this, Dr. Benson. I'd even auditioned for the Children's Week Christmas program. The biggest call in my life has been filled now. I am at peace. I found my church family. That's been a 14 year journey from another life I experienced before. Thanks to Chip, I am not the same man. I am brighter, bigger, and much lighter. Okay, notice there? That simply helped no longer where he was. Build a relationship. I want to share this one, Alan. This is from um, the Philippines, and I actually taught this, filmed this um, about 18 months ago when I was in Manila. Hi, Rahul Hai. I am Arya Singh, and I am 60 years old. I have uh, very basic symptoms. I have a heart attack. Um, I was suffering from abnormal uh, anemia. and healthy people learning and educating around 
still going as they are going, especially when it comes to my mind, I always try to think, I love this, I enjoy doing this, and thank you very much, good program. Just as an interesting aside, that exercise class was in the East Wood, that's in the big center of the biggest cemetery in Manila. That, that happens to be over the street from the public house that's there, and the, on the steps of the public house, but it happens to be the cemetery you go to look and you can see that them doing their exercise among the tombstones. This advertisement is actually 2010 in the Penumbra Chronicle. Um, it's the story of Bill Lee, who'd done a trip program and lost 26 kilos. That advertisement was seen by Pat Quinn. And this is um, Pat Quinn's story. That was um, Pat's story, and then Pat tried to get a trip program happening in Penumbra, and it took us two years to get that trip happening. But then there was another ad that appeared a few in the Penumbra Chronicle, and that's Pat's before and after doing the trip program. Um, and that's the um, trip thing in Penumbra, and that is 13 of the 17 people that Pat personally invited along to the trip program in Penumbra. Um, we now have Pat Quinn. Pat's now, in, or, or, um, now 80, and she's still running her counseling center in Toowoomba. And she's become a, a trip evangelist. Hi, Pat. It's all in the air. I went on the first day of camp last night, and there's no one there. Green flagging, vegetables, fruit, a bunch of protein stuff in there every morning. No berries, just almond milk, 
whole concept of plant-based is becoming more and more common and more and more popular. The CHIP program has put them in a package which we can take out of the community and share with our community. Is that okay there, Jeffrey? Jeffrey's chair's just collapsed. For those of you that are wondering what all the fuss is about, he seems to be fine. The Bible is very clear that God gives us good news, but He wants us to go and share that. What's good with you, brother and sisters, is you say you have faith, but you don't show up by action. For that kind of faith, save anyone. Suppose so you see a brother or a sister has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? We have an obligation to go and tell people how they can enjoy better health. Interesting, that video clip of Bill Clinton. We contacted CNN and said, can we use that video clip? What are you going to charge us for? And they came back and said, look, actually our agreement with Bill Clinton is that any interview with him, you've got to get permission from Bill, Bill Clinton. So we contacted his office, we asked us what chip was about, we explained it to him, he said, yes, you're welcome to use the video clip. Now, he's not promoting chip, please, I want to make that clear. But what he is promoting is the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, and he's given us permission to use that video clip. Okay, folks, we're going to have a break now for 10 minutes. So have a break for 10 minutes, and we'll, come, we'll start back at, well, it's going to be about 7 minutes. We'll start back at quarter past 11. Okay? Thank you very much.
Okay, let's make that a start again. And I'll go back to my box. I understand it's all good news from Sarasa, they can actually hear us and see us. So that's excellent. What I do need to do though is just grab someone from the back here. So you reckon Mark is going to play here? Okay, have you all got your facilitators manuals? Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to spend the next half hour or so looking at what um, the role of a chip facilitator is. So we're going to be looking at what chip is, the role of a chip facilitator. Um, we're going through that in some detail, and we'll be working through the chip facilitator manual. What I want to do, just to start with, is I want you to... Um, turn with me over to page there's the uh, the back and we'll go to page 40 in the chip facilitator manual. Okay? And what is the back of the facilitator manual are the lesson plans for your chip program. And so it tells you exactly what you've got to do. So you don't need to remember it. You don't need to come up with your own lesson plans. It's all here and it's all spelled out for you. But before we then we just what I want to do now is just play a short video clip which talks about what chip is. Thank you. 
and happiness are socially contagious. Did you know that? And it makes sense that so too can be health and community. Now, people often need each other to do their best to continue to be strong. And the group dynamics of kids creates the social security weapon that people journey together. They problem solve together. They overcome obstacles together. They become accountable to each other. And importantly, they get to celebrate one another. You know, just last night, a participant in a TIP program um, I'm involved with right now stood up and told how while only a few weeks into the program, the doctor had already lowered her insulin twice. You know, and the crowd went, whoa, woo! Well, sort of semi, at least. You know, it's true. We all need a team sport in life. And the social support that TIP provides is very, very powerful. It's great to be part of. And then TIP increases the participant's self-efficacy. You know, many people that are suffering from chronic diseases believe that it's out of their control. But TIP gives them an experience to show that they can affect change. In fact, the first month of the program is pitched as a self-experiment in which the participants are challenged to just give it a go and see what happens. And check this out. Well, I would like to hear from you this morning. Do you like challenges? I hope so. This challenge is just for one month. I'm not asking you to sign your life away or make a... You know, a lifelong commitment, I'm just saying, for one month, I would like you to conduct an experiment on yourself. An experiment to see what happens if you make radical shifts to the way that you eat and the way that you live. Well, for the next month, I want to challenge you to move as far up the end towards the optimal zone as you're able. And simultaneously, change the way that you move. 
break out in prolonged periods of sleep. He engaged in moderate, intense, and physical activity 30 minutes or more each day if he can. And what I will tell you is the extent to which he makes changes is the extent to which you can expect him to change. And there's a particular group of people that I specifically want to talk to. And you will know that if you're one of these, but there are some of us that need to make substantial changes to our health. You know, you find yourself in a ditch, and you may have been in that ditch for some period of time. And yeah, you've, you've made attempts to get out there, but they may have been small attempts, and it's like sort of taking these tiny little weeks of time to escape. And it actually becomes demotivating after a while. The best way to escape the ditch is to make a quantum leap. And so if you're one of those people that you know that you need to make those changes, I really want to encourage you that over the next month as a self-experiment, do this again. Change the way you eat. Change the way that you move. And you may well discover that this is a journey and a transformation towards living your life. At the beginning of the program, and then again after one and three months, the participants perform a health risk assessment. And this includes some blood work as well. And so they get to observe their improvements. And these serve as really powerful accountability measures. And the participants are commonly overwhelmed by the extent to which they can lower their cholesterol levels, reduce their blood sugar levels, and it greatly influences their self-efficacy. Now, this is why TIP is so intensive. Now, especially in that first month, so as to ensure that participants do enjoy substantial positive outcomes. You know, small changes in their lifestyle equate to small improvements in their health. Large changes result in substantive improvements. Now, there's a dose response to lifestyle medicine. And the intensive nature of TIP produces big changes and it does it rapidly. This greatly increases the participant's perceived control and hence boosts their motivation. And the full promotion that TIP delivers. Now, there are several other reasons why TIP works. It includes goal setting, self monitoring, and other elements known to achieve long term behavioural change. One of the unique components of TIP, however, is the distinctive plant based whole food eating pattern that's promoted in the program. Now, as it's not calorically restricted, participants can eat as much as they want and hence feel satiated. And that's a big plus because, hey, who wants to go hungry? Certainly not me. Now, TIP also doesn't just focus on food and physical activity, it adopts a whole of health perspective that encompasses things like stress management, sleep, self worth, emotional well being, and even happiness. And these things are commonly neglected in lifestyle intervention. But they can be so important to enabling people to sustain long term behavior change. These are some of the reasons why TIP works. So, by now you will have a pretty good idea of the principles that TIP is based upon. So, what does a TIP program actually look like? All up, there are 18 sessions that are delivered over a one to three month period. Each session contains about 25 or 45 minutes of performative but fun film content and 45 minutes of group discussion, interaction, and practical learning application. So, a session varies from one to two hours in length. Rest assured that there is a lot of flexibility in the program delivery, both in terms of session numbers and session length. Feel free to contact us to work out which delivery would suit your needs best. So let's now look at what a typical tip session looks like. In other words, how does it work? For an each of the 18 sessions, about half the time participants view an educational pre-recorded presentation that features three key personalities. Firstly, there's Dr. Hans Tim, the founder of TIP, who presents much of the information. Then, there's Dr. Andre Avery, a medical doctor who caringly encourages participants to partner with their personal doctor. And then, there's me, who goes out and about and puts the information into practice and has some fun with it. The other half of each session, the participants engage in group activities, including discussions, uh, cooking demonstrations, and group exercises. Now, our participants are provided with resources, including, let me say this, the Guru Crab. Here is the Live More Tip Kit. 
they saw it, the Christian said, the pedometer, so that they can't get sex. They get their drink, more like a drink bottle, so that they hydrate. And then there's three books, reference books, they get to refer to. The first one is the text. And it's here that details all the content covered in the program. And so participants can go through, you can see the information is beautifully presented. They can learn more. There's even pictures of my dad in here. He's a good looking guy. Then they have a cookbook which details a whole host of various different plant based recipes that they can use. And really importantly, there's a dessert section in there. And then last of all, there's the, the Live More workbook. And this is the participants' guide, and it's here that they get to truly engage with the content of the program. You see, it's in the workbook that they're encouraged to learn, experience, think, and care. L E T S. Let's. Now, the learn takes place through the videos. Now, the beauty of presenting the information in videos is that it takes the pressure off the facilitator because they don't have to be an expert in nutrition, physical activity, stress management, behavior change, positive psychology, and all the other areas covered in the program. Now, if they like, all they have to do to facilitate the session is plug it and play. Also, because the video content is downloadable by the facilitator, it can and is kept up to date. And so just to reiterate, the role of the facilitator is to simply manage the group dynamics. And if they have qualified expertise, they can, of course, share that. But the participants mostly learn through the video presentations that I supply. Experience involves the challenge that arises from what they've learned. Now, it might involve drinking more water or firing up their breakfast or reducing sick time. Essentially, it gets them to act on what they have learned. And then, when they return to the next session, they get to think and reflect on how the challenge went. In their groups, they talk about what worked well, what didn't work well, and what they could do better next time to make it work. And then finally, they're encouraged to share. Now, share what they've learned and are experiencing with others from their group of interest, their friends, their family, and their colleagues. You know, it's my experience that one of the best ways to learn something is to keep. And in keep, the participants are encouraged to do just that. So this is how it works. So I'm going to turn it all to the page um, page six. Okay, that's the page you've got on the screen here. Okay, and page. Okay, page six goes through what the chip program is and just as importantly, what the CHIP program is not. So page six there. Next one, two guys, good. Okay. First of all, the CHIP program is an educational program designed to support the process of disease reversal. So it's an educational program. It's not a medical treatment program. Okay, got the page there? Why don't you start, page six. And the next one is we've got page five. There we go. That's it. Okay. Yep. Um, on page six. So CHIP is an educational program. And it's important that you realize it's an educational program. CHIP is designed to assist individuals who want to prevent, arrest, or reverse chronic disease. CHIP is about the scientific validity of moderation and the health benefits of a whole food, food plant based diet. And we'll talk a little bit more this afternoon about the scientific validity of the program. Okay, 
Not only did Cain say, God, take the medication, they did say, God, take the medication. But they only do that in consultation with their doctor. My father is now in aged care in Toronto, not far, a couple of kilometers from where I live. We brought Dad up 18 months ago, 20th birthday with him last year. When Dad came up, he was on 29 different medications. Okay? And Dad was on medication, the medications for the medications. You know what I'm saying? And the, side, and the reality of the matter is that all of those medications interact with each other. And if I'd gone in and said, Dad, you need to cut out this medication or that medication, it could have been fatal for Dad. Because I don't understand the interactions. This is now working with a very good doctor in Morrisville. His medication has been reduced now to about half a dozen. And it's a lot better because of that. But it, it, it required someone who really knew what was happening, what the interactions were, how they were working to do that. And so if you, without medical expertise, recommend that someone change their medication, it can have dramatic impact on their health. And the PIP program is not a medical treatment program, it's a lifestyle program. And people only change medication in consultation with their doctor. Okay? Now, sometimes I'll be working with a doctor that is not particularly happy with that on medication, they may be treated by the doctor. But that's not your job. Your job is there as a facilitator for the program. Also, PIP is not a mandate for veganism or vegetarianism. PIP actually uses the term plant based. We don't use the term vegan or vegetarian, we use the term plant based. Because in our society, there are essentially three groups of people that go become vegan. Okay? What do you think the main reason that people in Australia become vegan? Right? Animal rights. Yeah. Okay? Now, one of the leading proponents of the lifestyle medicine, one of the leading researchers is a bloke called Neil Barner. His partner happens to be the president of PETA. You know the PETA? People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. They do all those ads with young actresses saying, I'd rather be naked than wear fur, and they, they do a lot of stuff. Now, I personally have a lot of sympathy for the animal rights movement. I believe Psalms tells us very clearly that everything that was created was created to give honour to God. If I destroy any of that creation, I'm taking away something that's giving that honour to God. That's, that's not the way that God has designed his world. I've, well, I've marched in an animal rights march. I turn my lights off for Earth Hour, you know, when it's from 8 to 9 o'clock for Earth Hour. I do that. But I do that as an individual. I don't do that as a representative of PIP. PIP is not an animal rights program. The other reason why a lot of people are vegan or vegetarian is for health reasons, so for religious reasons. I was in India 18 months ago. Went to a restaurant there and had on the menu, Jainist meals available on request. And I discovered that the Jainist the Jain Sikh, the Hindu Sikh, he does strict vegan. Okay. And that's great. The third reason why people do, and sorry, PIP is not a religious program. Okay? But the third reason why people do um, go to plant based or go vegan is for health reasons. And PIP promotes a plant based diet because they believe from the scientific evidence it gives the best health outcome. Okay? So PIP is not a mandate for veganism or vegetarianism. PIP is about helping people on their journey to better health. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And then really importantly, PIP is not a mandate for promoting personal bias, honey supplements, or product safety. I started my nursing training in 1975 over at Sydney, Sydney Adventist Hospital. When I was doing my nursing training, there was this miracle substance called Laetrile. Have any of you heard of Laetrile? It was the kernel of apricot, it was the kernel of apricot, apricot seed kernel. And it was supposed to cure all sorts of things. It may or may not have worked. I remember a few years ago, we actually came down from Papua New Guinea. Holiday, stayed at a place in Manly, and the person in charge of it was trying to sell us stuff called myotin. Money, glycan nutrition. Now, I'm not here to argue the benefits or otherwise of glycan nutrition. But, PIP is not about promoting these sort of supplements. They may or may not be good, but that's not PIP. Okay? Let me give you an example. The person who is the PIP or was a PIP coordinator, he's since taken over his job in the United States, is an Australian, well, born in Switzerland, but he's an Australian citizen, but his name is Stefan Hertel. And Stefan has come up with a 100% guaranteed weight loss diet. It's called the Midnight Broccoli Diet. And on Stefan's diet, you only eat broccoli, 
and you're going to need that book to get a good job. And if you go on a midnight book and job, I can guarantee you 150% that you will lose weight. But you don't promote the midnight book and job when you're doing chips. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? Chip program, as a facilitator for the chip program, you facilitate the chip material. You don't facilitate anything else. Now, we have had chip facilitators that are in health food stores, and that's great. But the chip program is not there to promote their health food stores. And in fact, I was responsible for the Gibbs University, the recipe book of chip implementation chip. It's a fantastic chip compliant recipe book. But when I'm running a chip program, I don't use the recipe for the chip implementation chip. I use the recipe from the chip recipe book. So as a chip facilitator, you are there to promote chip and to facilitate the chip program. You're not there to promote other stuff. As it says at the bottom of the page, page chip is about bringing people to better health, about making better health choices. Chip is not a vegan program. It's not an animal rights program. It's important that all facilitators facilitate only the chip material and not at the medical advice or personal diet. Any questions about that? Anything that wasn't clear? Okay, now I can go back to being a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, Mark. <laughs> Mark's just asking whether the broccoli is either the full moon or a half moon. Look, it works for both times, as long as you only eat at midnight, Mark. But remember, it's not about the midnight broccoli diet. Okay? Um, and, yeah. Let's turn over and have a look at the next page. Um, page 7 of our facilitator's manual. And here we look at tips position on tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, meat, dairy, and we can add eggs in there as well if you wanted to. And what tips position is that excessive consumption produces the worst possible health outcome. Minimal consumption of these um, products produces the best health outcome. We believe that abstinence produces the best health outcome. We promote and advocate less is more with the idea of being none at all. Our role is to help people on their journey to better life. And we need to understand that it is a journey. Just turn over the page and expand on that just a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark asked the question, I mentioned these why it's printed, because it's not just like when you're printing it. We're actually, going, we're actually going to spend evening in the manual at the moment. Okay? This is not a vegan program. It's about making good, about making good choices. Tips is to help people move from the left side of the spectrum to the right side of the spectrum. Okay, and whatever dietary pattern you have, whether you choose to eat meat, that's a, a choice that you make. But hot dogs, burgers, pizzas, bread meats um, is a healthy option. Using meat occasionally as a condiment is a lot more healthy option. And someone who is eating meat. If they're eating steak and spuds seven days a week, if they reduce their meat consumption to five days a week, they will see an improvement in their health. Once again, so I like to over vegetarian. And I've been a vegetarian all my life. I like to over vegetarian. But I knew all of the bakers in my town by first name. And I knew which one had the best Napoleon and which one had the best custard slice and which one had the best apple pie. Okay, vegetarian produce. Get low, back to over, strictly speaking, not meat products. But still, I was able to get to a very unhealthy state. Cheese, chocolate, soft drinks. I was strictly speaking vegetarian. Well, like the other vegetarian. Low fat milk, low, um, low fat yogurt, herbal tea, there's a lot of healthier options. And likewise, a total veg vegetarian or a vegan. Okay? Donuts, white bread, margarine are all strictly speaking vegan products. But they're not healthy products. Okay? Fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts in moderation is a healthy option. Science indicates that fast baking will give the best outcome for the genes reversal. And so what the CHIP program is about is about easing continuum. And what CHIP does is ask people to establish where they are on that continuum and where they want to get to. And your role as a facilitator is not to tell people where they want to get to. Look, from a Christian's perspective, if I ask you, what's the fundamental principle of Christianity? 
If you had to define Christianity in one word, what word would you use? Sorry? Choice? Love. Yes. Love. First John, God is love. That's what defines Christianity. And I discovered, as a 16-year-old boy, sitting in the classroom, staring across the room at Jennifer, no matter what I did, I couldn't call Jennifer to love her. That's the truth, Jennifer, about two years ago. But when? I've learned from that lesson. But that's another story. Do you understand what I'm saying? Love is about choice. And we have to respond to people in a loving way, whether it's with God or whether it's with anything else. And we need to say to people, where are you here? Where are you now? Where do you want to get to? And it may be just a slight move to the right. Or it may be, like a friend of mine, Russell Wood, who was a teacher in Christchurch. He went and saw his doctor, and his doctor said, Russell, you need to have some time out for bypass. And Russell said, no, I'm going to go on the trip program. And his doctor said, okay, I'll give you six weeks to do trip, and then we'll do the problem out for bypass. Russell did the trip program. And as Russell would say, he went the whole hog. I'm not sure that's appropriate for a trip program or not, but Russell adopted the trip program 150%. Ten years later, Russell's now in his late 70s, and he's doing fine. He's never had to have a problem with alcohol bypass. His cholesterol levels have come down. His angina has disappeared completely. And you see this happening over and over again. But Russell went right as far as he could on the trip program. Okay? Got great outcome. And if you read progressive from the prevent and reverse heart disease, you see a whole pile of stories of people there. It, it's doable, but it's up to the individual. And a young person who just wants to see an improvement in their health may even make a slight trip. But what we're doing as trip facilitators do, trip facilitators, is helping people on that journey to better health. Any questions about that? Okay? So you are not the health expert. You may be a doctor, you may be a nurse. Great. Hence, that's the key. But some of you are. And most of our trip facilitators are not. They're complete lay people when it comes to health. The experts are on the video. Han Sue, Darren Morton, Andre Avery, they're the experts on the video. Your journey is just that exciting journey of helping people to a better health. What I'd like to do now is have a look at this. Hey, look here. Sorry? Yes, please. Okay, so Erickson's question is a very good question. It is, some people may be afraid to run the program because they're, they're afraid of questions people are going to ask. And thank you for raising that, Erickson. And look, there are four approaches that you take to those, ask those questions. The first one is, you're doing section four. And they say, what about type 2 diabetes? And you can say, fantastic question. Session seven is a whole session on type 2 diabetes. Come back and have a look at session seven, and I'm sure that will answer your question. The other thing is that on the TRIP website, which I will show you later today, we have some condition papers. So if they ask questions about cholesterol, about alcohol, about the plant-based diet, there's a whole series of condition papers there which you can get the condition papers, you can print them off and you can present to people to do it. The third option, if they ask you a question, is to say, Eric, that's a great question. Right now, I don't know the answer. I'm just a facilitator, I'm not the expert, but I will get the answer for you. And you send an e email to me. The email address is on the back of the manual here, on the last page of the manual, info at triphealth.org.au. And we have a panel of experts, Dr. Hans Dewey, Dr. Wayne Dyson, and Dr. John Kelly, and a couple of other people on that panel, and they will come back to you within 48 hours with a certified trip answer. And so you can go back to your next session, and you can say, last session, you ask this question. Here is the official trip answer to that question. Now, Simon Barton, who actually works in Sydney, he's a dietitian. He's actually the keeper of those answers. And the reality of the matter is now 99% of the questions we get asked have been asked before, and so we have an answer so we can come back to you relatively quickly. But if, say, if not, we'll go to our panel and we'll come back to you with an official trip answer. The fourth option is if you happen to be a health professional, you can say, look, I don't know what the trip answer is, but as, as a health professional, this is what I would recommend for you. But please be careful, because I've talked before about education and about being potentially sick. If you are a medical doctor, you have medical liability wherever you go. But when I did my nursing training, 
we were told, if you see an accident, by all means go and help, but don't tell anyone else. Because we don't have liability coverage. My wife is covered by liability insurance. When she was at work, as soon as she stepped out of work, she no longer has that liability coverage. So just be careful if you, if you give advice because you're not covered by liability. Okay? Is this, if you're a doctor, if you're in a business, you can, um, you can give that advice. And so my, my recommendation would be, but as a facilitator, without a medical background, then you either refer them to another program, you go to a prescription patient, or you say, I'll get the answer for you, and you email us, and we'll give you an assistance with that answer. So Erickson, does that, thanks very much, that was an excellent question. Okay, now, the KIP flywheel. KIP program is 18 sessions of video content. And there's actually 20 sessions in total. The first session is an information session. And we'll talk about the information session after lunch. The next um, 18 sessions are the content sessions. And then we have a celebration night at the end of the program. We go after the first lunch or at the end of the program. And this particular diagram that we're looking at is on page um, 32. 32, I guess it says that or something. Okay? Now, we recommend to the KIP program that the first month is fairly intense. Okay? And the reason for that is that for a lot of people, changing from a meat based diet to a plant based diet is a challenge. And they need the help and the support to, to make those changes. Once you've made the change, it's a lot easier. When I was a young fella, we used to see these big steam machines every now and then, steam engines, and they had, all had a great big wheel at the front of it. And the wheel was really heavy metal. It was called a flywheel. And to start the flywheel turning was really, really hard. But once it got turning, it was really hard to stop it. And it would keep going under its own momentum. And so that's what we call the kick flywheel effect, where we start with high intensity and then we drop out. We drop, not drop out, we, we, we lower the intensity um, down again. So our recommendation is 12 sessions in the first month and then one session of each of the next two months after that. However, you need to work within the context that you're working. Earlier this year, we ran a trip program in the West Coast I work at, which is head office for seven day rental trips. We ran it from lunchtime, we ran it from 12.30 to 1.30, two days a week for nine weeks. Okay, because there's two, two versions of the trip videos. There's a 25 minute session for work for corporate um, programs, and there's a 45 minute program session for the community. We ran a 25 minute session, we ran it during the lunch break, ran it for nine weeks, had great results out of that. We've also had pro um, programs that they run one session a week for 18 weeks. We don't recommend that, but if that's the only option you've got, it's better than nothing. Okay? So it's up to you to work out what's going to work in your environment. And likewise, primary programs. As I said, in the corporate workplace, 1230 to 1.30 works great because it was lunch break. And people just come during the lunch break. For some of you, it's going to be worth first in the evening. And that's when most community programs will fit. But you may be in a community where there's a lot of young mothers there. And it may be easier for the young mothers to come at 10 o'clock. You may be in a community like they were in um, the gospel program last year, where there's a lot of kids there. And they actually did a 10.30 program and a 7.30 program. Well, identical sessions, but it took a pretty good session they went to to pay the, pay the kids kids there. If you were in a retirement village and we had another little park up on the Gold Coast, ran a um, concurrent company program there and do a 2 o'clock program in the afternoon, if that's going to fit. So it's up to you to work to find out what time space works for you. Now, what I'm going to do now is I want to play you a video that goes through a summary of all of the kids' sessions. Before we do that, I'm going to see if I can get the microphone off properly so the folks in the garage can hear it. And um, then we'll wrap the whole video. Mum, can I just get you to be here? I think it's just the screen that I've got when it's got the screen that's taken out and turned back. There you go. Right. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's very special for me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, what we're looking for is, and I'll talk about that this afternoon, we wanted, we do blood tests at the beginning of the program, 
and then we did blood tests two weeks later. And the blood results come back and said to 12 here. And so we want that month, we want that at least three and a half, four weeks before sex as well. So we get the blood results back. Okay? Now, some people do two, two sessions a week for the first six weeks. And that works fine. Some people do three sessions, others do three sessions for that first week. It's up to you to, to work out how you fit there. But we need to get the results within that first month. Because and we'll get into the talk more about this right here. But those, those blood test results give back very positive feedback to the participants so they can see the numbers changing and get the feedback on how they are. Okay? Excellent. So we'll have a look at this video now on the six sessions. The last time the sessions are split, split into five phases. And the first phase, actually the first two sessions, develops the idea that lifestyle is the best medicine. The second phase then concentrates on two of the pillars of lifestyle medicine, that is nutrition and physical activity. And this then brings us to the end of the first month or so, where in session 12, the participants receive the results of their first three tests and are encouraged to set goals moving forward. And we move from our setting to this time, after the first month of conducting this self-experiment, because they're better informed to create challenging and realistic goals. In the next phase, spanning sessions 13 to 16, the emphasis is on how to stick with the lifestyle changes they've made. That is, how to change the good. And then finally, in the last phase, stress management, emotional well-being, and things from positive psychology are explored. And the objective here is to equip not just healthy people, but happy ones as well. After all, there's a link between the two. So here is a short synopsis of each session. Session one. This session paints a picture showing just how pervasive and serious chronic lifestyle diseases are. And importantly, how effective lifestyle medicine can be at managing and even treating them. By the end of this session, the participant understands the principles of lifestyle medicine and are developing an understanding that they can take the initiative to take control of their own health. Session two. This session is all about lifestyle medicine, how it treats the causes and not just the symptoms of disease, and that it has been scientifically shown to be highly effective. By the end of this session, the participant understands that lifestyle medicine and treat offer the tools and resources for a journey to better health and well-being. Session 3 explores the effects of a plant-based diet, regular physical activity, and not smoking on the length and quality of our lives. By the end of this session, the participant has an understanding of the underlying mechanisms that drive chronic disease and how lifestyle medicine can combat these. Session 4. This session dives deeper into the core components of a plant-based diet and regular exercise and living the optimal lifestyle. By the end of the session, the participant understands the components of the optimal lifestyle and how to implement them. Session 5 is all about plant-based eating habits, which is nutrient-dense rather than energy-dense, to help with sustained weight loss. By the end of the session, the participant can explain the difference between nutrient density and energy density. Being aware of the energy density of foods is of tremendous value when it comes to controlling their body weight. And I have this simple little illustration to show you just how important it is. Here I have two food items. Exhibit A, the humble pie. And exhibit B, a chocolate bar. Also with me I have two friends, Tiff and Heather, who have given us the offer to eat and run, or at least eat and walk. Now what we're going to explore is how long does it take to burn off the energy contained within those two items. Now, Tiff, you get the carrot, and Heather, you get the chocolate bar. Bon appetit. Now, even though I asked you to jog, you've still got some time to go. 
discusses the benefits of whole plant-based foods. They are naturally high in fiber with many positive health benefits. By the end of the session, the participant can name the benefits of a high-fiber diet, can list some of the foods high in fiber, and know some easy ways how to increase the fiber in your diet. Session 7 addresses how our lifestyles can help to disarm type 2 diabetes. By the end of the session, the participant has gained an understanding of the causes of type 2 diabetes and how to disarm type 2 diabetes using the optimal lifestyle. Session 8 is an introduction to cholesterol and atherosclerosis, the causes of atherosclerosis and its effects on health. The participant will learn what can be done to help reduce atherosclerosis. Session 9 delves into using lifestyle to control blood pressure. And also explores that a whole plant based food contains sufficient amounts of protein to help. Session 10. This session looks at the protective properties of the optimal lifestyle and brain health. By the end of the session, the participant has gained an understanding of osteoporosis and how lifestyle can be hugely protective of brain health. The optimal lifestyle supports cancer protection. And in session 11, the participant gains an insight into the role of lifestyle in increasing the risk of certain types of cancer. Session 12 discusses the best way for participants to understand and interpret the results from their health risk assessment and blood tests, as well as how to set smart goals. They will walk away with an insight into why certain biometric values will have increased or decreased, and how to set smart goals to help them further on their journey to better health and well-being. Session 13 marks the beginning of an exploration of how the participant can get set for success on their quest to live a healthier lifestyle in the long term. It explores the interaction between our beliefs, feelings and behaviours, and also bursts the myth that our faith is always determined by our DNA. By the end of the session, the participant has gained insight into some of the factors that drive the behaviour and what can be done about it. And they also understand why DNA is not necessarily scale destiny. Session 14. In order to make sustained lifestyle changes, there may be issues in our past that should be dealt with. By the end of the session, the participant has a better understanding of the importance of forgiveness and what that really means, and will have received some tools to help them forgive. Session 15 recognizes that our environment can promote obesity. It's a good signal. But we have a ways to re-engineer our environment to support positive health. By the end of this session, the participant can critically examine their environment and they have ideas and tips to make positive changes in their environment that can help make the healthier choices the easier choices. Session 16. Stress, who doesn't know it? Stress to some degree is of some benefit, but it can also have a major negative impact on our health. By the end of this session, the participant has gained an understanding of how stress can impact their health and, importantly, is equipped with ideas how to better cope with stress in the future. Session 17 is called Fix How You Feel and provides proven strategies for taking charge of your emotional state. By the end of the session, 
just as a quick description of who he is. And again, the, a greater appreciation of how important the most intelligence is for making positive lifestyle choices. Session 18. This session explores a wonderful world of positive psychology principles in living a fulfilled life. So, if you think this comprehensive, well, we're not done yet. Apart from the 80 sessions or selection of them, you can also include the following, but please note they're not mandatory. But they include information sessions, food samples and demos, the jump start stage, and there are other optional activities and resources as well. For example, a shopping tour, a ceremony at the end of the program, and last but not least, ongoing group support after the program. Let's look at each of them in greater detail. Really important in the textbook 
is that each chapter of this book is very heavily referenced up to the time of the Lord. So any time made in the book program, before we allow that time to be promoted, we have to go back and find reference to it and evidence to it each and each slide of the book. One thing I do want to explain to you as a facilitator is there's 18 sessions in the book program, there's 18 chapters in the textbook, but the 18 chapters in the textbook don't follow the same order as the program. Because in the program, session four, which we're having at the last of lunch, there is talks about diet and talks about exercise in the same session. But when you're writing a textbook, you put all the chapters on exercise together and you put all the chapters on diet together. So it doesn't follow, it doesn't follow through. What we encourage the participants to do is we encourage them to go through and read the chapters in the textbook each night for their homework. And I'll show you how that works in just a minute. The next part of the rest of the book, of the, sorry, of the textbook, is the rest of the book. And surprise, surprise, it's the rest of the book. I thought it was originally in the name, but that. But this is what the rest of the book is all for a course of quick recipes. Now, my, some of the recipes, because we do have a dessert section in it, just a minute, and let me see. Some of the recipes, like the recipe on page 106, 160, I should say. Um, I'm an attachment cream parfait. This one here absolutely derives from it. I highly recommend it. But the little note on it. No, this dessert can only be consumed for special occasions because it is very high calorie. But what we're trying to show people is that, you know, you can have a broad range of food when it comes to a whole food plant based diet. And so there's a wide range of recipes in that book. And the third book in the Triple Six in the Pit is the Live More Workbook. Now, this is probably the most important book in the whole kit, and this is the one that you as a kit facilitator need to be very, very, very familiar with. Okay? So, you've got, those of you got the kit books, you've got the Live More um, Participant Workbook out. Okay? And I'd like to ask you to turn to page 32. Of your Live More Participant Workbook. And I'm just going to page 32, because that's in session four. And after lunch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through session four of the kit program just so you can see exactly how it works and comes together. But you'll see in the Participant Workbook, and each chapter in the Participant Workbook, each stage is actually the same. Well, not exactly the same, it has the same components in it. The first component is the Discover section. Okay? So you discover written up there, and the Discover section is information from the video. So what we do is we actually encourage people to quickly get their workbook open in front of them when they're watching the video and make a note as they go through the So I think that stuff that's directly mentioned in the video is stuff that expands a little bit to help them work through them. The set, if you turn over to page, to page 34, you have what's called the experience section. Okay? And each um, section of the workbook has an experience section. And the experience section is the activity that we want people to do. Okay? The session one is jump start. The session two is warm up. The session three is getting some exercise. But this one, this one here, we actually have even been continuing. And we want people to decide where they are now, where they want to get to, and put in three goals in order to help them get there. So the experience section is the practical stuff that we want them to do, or at least that we want them to take away. If you turn over to page 36, you'll see on page 36, we've got the explore section. Now, the explore section is the homework that we want participants to do. And in this case, we want them to go and read, want them to read chapter 10 from the textbook. And then once they've read it, go through and fill out the question on this page here. And the last, the fourth section, the last section, is a little red or a little, what is it, apricot color. colour? Um, circle down there, and that's the floor section. And the floor, the floor section, on this particular page, it's the white sand that's right for wall. Very simple. But the floor section has two purposes. First of all, it's people only really learn something if they can explain or refer it to something to someone else. We happen to homeschool my kids. And part of that homeschooling was teaching them time savers. So my job was to teach the kids to read and to teach them time savers. And to teach them to drive. That was the three 
my wife would always know. She's really good about that. But if you had asked me 20 years ago, what 77 stood for, I would have had to stop and I'd have had to think. Um, why 7 to 35? 6 7 plus 35 plus 2 must be 42. And then 42 plus 7 is 40. 7 7 is 49. But now, if you say, hey, what's 7 7? Why can't you say 49 just like that? Because I've actually teach three kids what 7 7 does. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so we're encouraging the people to share as it helps these children and encourage them. But the other thing is, the kids program also talks to our participants that life is not just about money. Here's the point of life only comes when you start sharing it with other people. And so we start right from the start of the kids program, giving people resources to share. And as they move through, some of the share tends to be sharing at the fitness level or sharing some other stuff in life. But we want them right from the start to share. So you've got the four sections, okay? The first section is the experience phase. The first section is the discover section. Okay? Information that comes from the video component. The next section is the experience section, which is the practical thing that we want them to take away from that particular section of uh, the program. Then discover, sorry, then, sorry, not discover, let me start to say. Then we explore, which is the homework, and then we share. The other thing I want you to look at in the particular that's not on your program, the other thing I want you to think about and look at is in this worksheet, is the question set. When it comes to discussing questions, here at the school, they don't have to think up the questions. They simply take the questions from here and open them up to a class for discussion. So, on page 33, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, rate the important group you're following to your part two question. Okay? Is pace the most important when it comes to reading through? Is price the most important? And talk about that as a group. Discuss it. Go for it. So you don't have to come up with questions. You've simply got to reflect on the questions that are already here. So we do that to try and make it easier for them as the kids and facilitator to go through and get that discussion going. But one of the things when it comes to a kids' program, one of the things we find as a facilitator is it's very difficult to stick to the 90-minute time slot. Okay, first time's not your problem. So the time we get to session three, session four, they're all getting excited about it. They want to talk about it. And the videos take 45 minutes. The cooking demonstration takes about 10 minutes. The discussion, I mean, you've only got about 30 minutes left for discussion by the time you do the role play and by the time you talk about exercise. And it's really easy for that discussion to go way too long. And as a facilitator, one of your primary roles is to rein in the discussion and say, okay, we need to keep moving. Because people may once or twice be happy to come out for a little bit longer. But particularly in a teaching program, it's starting at 7 and then a day period. People are going to get to work the next day. Parents have got babysitters. And if you start going too long, it becomes really hard as you get further on to it. So make sure you stick to the 90 minutes for your kids' session. Okay, any questions that we've got about what we've talked about? That we need to have a look at? Now, those of you that are after, if you want to text your questions to Assistant um, Christina or um, Wally, they'll, they'll, pick up, they'll pass them on to you. Yes, Wally. Yes. Okay. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about the demonstrations later. But the ideal is that you do a cooking demonstration every night. Okay. But in the facilitator's manual, we recommend specific recipes for nine of the classes. If you realise in some of the areas, it's really difficult to do a cooking demonstration every night. So we'll talk more about how that works. The idea is doing a cooking demonstration every night, but you need to do at least nine cooking demonstrations during the evening for each session. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Really good question. So the key components of a kids session are obviously the video component, the cooking demonstration, exercise component, and the group discussion. And that's basic. And after lunch, we're going to go through session 12. Sorry. After lunch, we're going to go through session 4 of the kids program. And we'll go through that from, from start to finish to show you on how it works and how it all goes together. Okay. It is 25, 26 minutes past 12. Let's stop and have lunch. And we'll come back again at quarter past one. Okay? So that's just before we break for lunch. I'm not sure what you've got in Karaka. We've got Subway here for lunch. Okay? 
Um, it's just really great for us. It's just so great. Lord, thanks so much for the opportunity we've got to have you here and share this with you and more. Thank you for the gift you've given. Amen.